The Informer, an ironic tale by Joseph Conrad. Mr. X came to me, preceded by a letter of introduction from a good friend of mine in Paris, specifically to see my collection of Chinese bronzes and porcelain. My friend in Paris is a collector too. He collects neither porcelain, nor bronzes, nor pictures, nor medals, nor stamps, nor anything that could be profitably dispersed under an auctioneer's hammer. He would reject, with genuine surprise, the name of a collector. Nevertheless, that's what he is by temperament. He collects acquaintances. It is delicate work. He brings to it the patience, the passion, the determination of a true collector of curiosities. His collection does not contain any royal personages. I don't think he considers them sufficiently rare and interesting, but, with that exception, he has met with and talked to everyone worth knowing on any conceivable ground. He observes them, listens to them, penetrates them, measures them, and puts the memory away in the galleries of his mind. He has schemed, plotted, and travelled all over Europe in order to add to his collection of distinguished personal acquaintances. As he is wealthy, well-connected, and unprejudiced, his collection is pretty complete including objects, or should I say subjects, whose value is unappreciated by the vulgar and often unknown to popular fame, of Trevolt of modern times. The world knows him as a revolutionary writer whose savage irony has laid bare the rottenness of the most respectable institutions. He has scalped every venerated head and has mangled at the stake of his wit every received opinion and every recognized principle of conduct and policy. Who does not remember his flaming red revolutionary pamphlets? Their sudden swarmings used to overwhelm the powers of every continental police like a plague of crimson gadflies. But this extreme writer has been also the active inspirer of secret societies, the mysterious unknown number one of desperate conspiracies suspected and unsuspected, matured or baffled and the world at large has never had an inkling of that fact. This accounts for him going about amongst us to this day, a veteran of many subterranean campaigns, standing aside now, safe within his reputation of merely the greatest destructive publicist that ever lived. Thus wrote my friend, adding that Mr. X was an enlightened connoisseur of bronzes in China and asking me to show him my collection. X turned up in due course. My treasures are disposed in three large rooms without carpets and curtains. There is no other furniture than the etigrees and the glass cases whose contents shall be worth a fortune to my heirs. I allow no fires to be lighted for fear of accidents, and a fireproof door separates them from the rest of the house. It was a bitter cold day. We kept on our overcoats and hats. Middle-sized and spare, his eyes alert in a long, Roman-nosed countenance, X walked on his neat little feet with short steps and looked at my collection intelligently. I hope I looked at him intelligently, too. A snow-white moustache and imperial made his nut-brown complexion appear darker than it really was. In his fur coat and shiny tall hat, that terrible man looked fashionable. I believe he belonged to a noble family and could have called himself Vicon X de la Zide if he chose. We talked nothing but bronzes and porcelain. He was remarkably appreciative. We parted on cordial terms. Where he was staying, I don't know. I imagine he must have been a lonely man. Anarchists, I suppose, have no families. Not, at any rate, as we understand that social relation. Organization into families may answer to a need of human nature, but in the last instance it is based on law, and therefore must be something odious and impossible to an anarchist. But indeed, I don't understand anarchists. Does a man of that, of that, persuasion still remain an anarchist when alone, quite alone and going to bed, for instance? Does he lay his head on the pillow, pull his bedclothes over him, and go to sleep with the necessity of the Chambardement General, as the French slang has it, of the general blow-up, always present to his mind? And if so, how can he? I am sure that if such a faith, or such a fanaticism, once mastered my thoughts, I would never be able to compose myself sufficiently to sleep or eat, or perform any of the routine acts of daily life. I would want no wife, 
No children, I could have no friends, it seems to me. And as to collecting bronzes or china, that, I should say, would be quite out of the question. But I don't know. All I know is that Mr. X took his meals in a very good restaurant, which I frequented also. With his head uncovered, the silver top knot of his brushed-up hair completed the character of his physiognomy, all bony ridges and sunken hollows, clothed in a perfect impassiveness of expression. His meagre brown hands, emerging from large white cuffs, came and went breaking bread, pouring wine and so on, with quiet, mechanical precision. His head and body above the tablecloth had a rigid immobility. This firebrand, this great agitator, exhibited the least possible amount of warmth and animation. His voice was rasping, cold and monotonous in a low key. He could not be called a talkative personality, but with his detached, calm manner, he appeared as ready to keep the conversation going as to drop it at any moment, and his conversation was by no means commonplace. To me, I own, there was some excitement in talking quietly across a dinner table with a man whose venomous pen stabs had sapped the vitality of at least one monarchy. That much was a matter of public knowledge. But I knew more. I knew of him, from my friend, as a certainty what the guardians of social order in Europe had at most only suspected or dimly guessed at. He had had what I may call his underground life. And as I sat, Evening after evening, facing him at dinner, a curiosity in that direction would naturally arise in my mind. I am a quiet and peaceable product of civilization, and know no passion other than the passion for collecting things which are rare and must remain exquisite, even if approaching to the monstrous. Some Chinese bronzes are monstrously precious, and here, out of my friend's collection, here I had before me a kind of rare monster. It is true that this monster was polished and, in a sense, even exquisite. His beautiful, unruffled manner was that. But then he was not of bronze. He was not even Chinese, which would have enabled one to contemplate him calmly across the gulf of racial difference. He was alive and European. He had the manner of good society, wore a coat and hat like mine, and had pretty near the same taste in cooking. It was too frightful to think of. One evening he remarked, casually, in the course of conversation, there's no amendment to be got out of mankind except by terror and violence. You can imagine the effect of such a phrase out of such a man's mouth upon a person like myself, whose whole scheme of life had been based upon a suave and delicate discrimination of social and artistic values. Just imagine, upon me, to whom all sorts and forms of violence appeared as unreal as the giants, ogres, and seven-headed hydras whose activities affect, fantastically, the course of legends and fairy tales. I seemed suddenly to hear above the festive bustle and clatter of the brilliant restaurant the mutter of a hungry and seditious multitude. I suppose I'm impressionable and imaginative. I had a disturbing vision of darkness, full of lean jaws and wild eyes, amongst the hundred electric lights of the place. But somehow, this vision made me angry, too. The sight of that man, so calm, breaking bits of white bread, exasperated me. And I had the audacity to ask him how it was that the starving proletariat of Europe, to whom he had been preaching revolt and violence, had not been made indignant by his openly luxurious life. At all this, I said pointedly, with a glance round the room and at the bottle of champagne we generally shared between us at dinner. He remained unmoved. Do I feed on their toil and their heart's blood? Am I a speculator or a capitalist? Did I steal my fortune from a starving people? No, they know this very well, and they envy me nothing. The miserable mass of the people is generous to its leaders. What I have acquired has come to me through my writings, not from the millions of pamphlets distributed gratis to the hungry and the oppressed, but from the hundreds of thousands of copies sold to the well-fed bourgeoisie. You know that my writings were at one time the rage, the fashion, the thing to read with wonder and horror, to turn your eyes up at my pathos, or else to laugh in ecstasies at my wit. Yes, I admitted. I remember, of course. 
and I confess frankly that I could never understand that infatuation. Don't you know yet, he said, that an idle and selfish class loves to see mischief being made, even if it is made at its own expense? Its own life being all a matter of pose and gesture, it is unable to realize the power and the danger of a real movement and of words that have no sham meaning. It is all fun and sentiment. It is sufficient, for instance, to point out the attitude of the old French aristocracy towards the philosophers whose words were preparing the great revolution. Even in England, where you have some common sense, a demagogue has only to shout loud enough and long enough to find some backing in the very class he is shouting at. You, too, like to see mischief being made. The demagogue carries the amateurs of emotion with him. Amateurism in this, that, and the other thing is a delightfully easy way of killing time and feeding one's own vanity, the silly vanity of being abreast with the ideas of the day after tomorrow. Just as good and otherwise harmless people will join you in ecstasies over your collection without having the slightest notion in what its marvellousness really consists. I hung my head. It was a crushing illustration of the sad truth he advanced. The world is full of such people, and that instance of the French aristocracy before the revolution was extremely telling too. I could not traverse his statement, though its cynicism, always a distasteful trait, took off much of its value to my mind. However, I admit I was impressed. I felt the need to say something which would not be in the nature of assent, and yet would not invite discussion. You don't mean to say, I observed airily, that extreme revolutionists have ever been actively assisted by the infatuation of such people. I did not mean exactly that by what I said just now. I generalized. But since you ask me, I may tell you that such help has been given to revolutionary activities, more or less consciously, in various countries, and even in this country. Impossible, I protested with firmness. We don't play with fire to that extent. And yet, you can better afford it than others, perhaps. But let me observe that most women, if not always ready to play with fire, are generally eager to play with a loose spark or so. Is this a joke? I asked, smiling. If it is, I am not aware of it, he said, woodenly. I was thinking of an instance. Oh, mild enough in a way. I became all expectation at this. I had tried many times to approach him on his underground side, so to speak. The very word had been pronounced between us, but he had always met me with his impenetrable calm. And at the same time, Mr. X continued, it will give you a notion of the difficulties that may arise in what you are pleased to call underground work. It is sometimes difficult to deal with them. Of course, there is no hierarchy amongst the affiliated, no rigid system. My surprise was great but short-lived. Clearly, amongst extreme anarchists, there could be no hierarchy, nothing in the nature of a law of precedence. The idea of anarchy ruling among anarchists was comforting, too. It could not possibly make for efficiency. Mr. X startled me by asking, abruptly, You know Hermione Street? I nodded, doubtful assent. Hermione Street has been, within the last three years, improved out of any man's knowledge. The name exists still, but not one brick or stone of the old Hermione Street is left now. It was the old street he meant, for he said, there was a row of two-storied brick houses on the left, with their backs against the wing of a great public building, you remember. Would it surprise you very much to hear that one of these houses was for a time the centre of anarchist propaganda and of what you would call underground action? Not at all, I declared. Hermione Street had never been particularly respectable, as I remembered it. The house was the property of a distinguished government official, he added, sipping his champagne. Oh, indeed, I said, this time not believing a word of it. Of course he was not living there, Mr. X continued, but from ten till four he sat next door to it, the dear man, in his well-appointed private room in the wing of the public building I've mentioned. To be strictly accurate, I must explain that the house in Hermione Street did not really belong to him. It belonged to his grown-up children, a daughter and a son. The girl, a fine figure, was by no means vulgarly pretty. To more personal charm than mere youth could account for, 
She added the seductive appearance of enthusiasm, of independence, of courageous thought. I suppose she put on these appearances as she put on her picturesque dresses and for the same reason, to assert her individuality at any cost. You know, women would go to any length almost for such a purpose. She went to a great length. She had acquired all the appropriate gestures of revolutionary convictions, the gestures of pity, of anger, of indignation against the anti-humanitarian vices of the social class to which she belonged herself. All this sat on her striking personality as well as her slightly original costumes. Very slightly original, just enough to mark a protest against the philistinism of the overfed taskmasters of the poor. Just enough, and no more. It would not have done to go too far in that direction, you understand. But she was of age, and nothing stood in the way of her offering her house to the revolutionary workers. You don't mean it, I cried. I assure you, he affirmed, that she made that very practical gesture. How else could they have got hold of it? The cause is not rich, and moreover, there would have been difficulties with any ordinary house agent who would have wanted references and so on. The group she came in contact with while exploring the poor quarters of the town, you know the gesture of charity and personal service which was so fashionable some years ago, accepted with gratitude. The first advantage was that Hermione Street is, as you know, well away from the suspect part of the town, specially watched by the police. The ground floor consisted of a little Italian restaurant of the fly-blown sort. There was no difficulty in buying the proprietor out. A woman and a man belonging to the group took it on. The man had been a cook. The comrades could get their meals there, unnoticed amongst the other customers. This was another advantage. The first floor was occupied by a shabby variety artists' agency, an agency for performers in inferior music halls, you know. A fellow called Bomb, I remember. He was not disturbed. It was rather favourable than otherwise to have a lot of foreign-looking people, jugglers, acrobats, singers of both sexes and so on, going in and out all day long. The police paid no attention to new faces, you see. The top floor happened, most conveniently, to stand empty then. X interrupted himself to attack impassively, with measured movements, a bomb glassy, which the waiter had just set down on the table. He swallowed carefully a few spoonfuls of the ice sweet and asked me, Did you ever hear of Stone's dried soup? Hear of what? It was, X pursued evenly, a comestible article once rather prominently advertised in the dailies, but which never somehow gained the favour of the public. The enterprise fizzled out, as you say here. Parcels of their stock could be picked up at auctions at considerably less than a penny a pound. The group bought some of it, and an agency for Stone's dried soup was started on the top floor. A perfectly respectable business. The stuff, a yellow powder of extremely unappetizing aspect, was put up in large square tins, of which six went to a case. If anybody ever came to give an order, it was, of course, executed. But the advantage of the powder was this, that things could be concealed in it very conveniently. Now and then, a special case got put on a van and sent off to be exported abroad under the very nose of the policeman on duty at the corner. You understand? I think I do, I said, with an expressive nod at the remnants of the bomb melting slowly in the dish. Exactly. But the cases were useful in another way, too. In the basement, or in the cellar at the back, rather, two printing presses were established. A lot of revolutionary literature of the most inflammatory kind was got away from the house in Stone's dried soup cases. The brother of our anarchist young lady found some occupation there. He wrote articles, helped to set up type and pull off the sheets, and generally assisted the man in charge, a very able young fellow called Severin. The guiding spirit of that group was a fanatic of social revolution. He is dead now. He was an engraver and etcher of genius. You must have seen his work. It is much sought after by certain amateurs now. He began by being revolutionary in his art, and ended by becoming a revolutionist, after his wife and child had died in want and misery. He used to say that the bourgeoisie, the smug, overfed lot, had killed them. That was his real belief. 
he still worked at his art and led a double life. He was tall, gaunt, and swarthy, with a long, brown beard and deep-set eyes. You must have seen him. His name was Horn. At this I was really startled. Of course, years ago I used to meet Horn about. He looked like a powerful rough gypsy in an old top hat with a red muffler round his throat and buttoned up in a long, shabby overcoat. He talked of his art with exultation and gave one the impression of being strung up to the verge of insanity. A small group of connoisseurs appreciated his work. Who would have thought that this man? Amazing. And yet, it was not, after all, so difficult to believe. As you see, X went on, this group was in a position to pursue its work of propaganda, and the other kind of work too, under very advantageous conditions. They were all resolute, experienced men of a superior stamp, and yet we became struck at length by the fact that plans prepared in Hermione Street almost invariably failed. Who were we? I asked pointedly. Some of us in Brussels, at the centre, he said hastily. Whatever vigorous action originated in Hermione Street seemed doomed to failure. Something always happened to baffle the best planned manifestations in every part of Europe. It was a time of general activity. You must not imagine that all our failures are of a loud sort, with arrests and trials. That is not so. Often the police work quietly, almost secretly, defeating our combinations by clever counterplotting. No arrests, no noise, no alarming of the public mind and inflaming the passions. It is a wise procedure. But at that time, the police were too uniformly successful from the Mediterranean to the Baltic. It was annoying and began to look dangerous. At last, we came to the conclusion that there must be some untrustworthy elements amongst the London groups, and I came over to see what could be done quietly. My first step was to call upon our young lady amateur of anarchism at her private house. She received me in a flattering way. I judged that she knew nothing of the chemical and other operations going on at the top of the house in Hermione Street. The printing of anarchist literature was the only activity she seemed to be aware of there. She was displaying very strikingly the usual signs of severe enthusiasm and had already written many sentimental articles with ferocious conclusions. I could see she was enjoying herself hugely with all the gestures and grimaces of deadly earnestness. They suited her big-eyed, broad-browed face and the good carriage of her shapely head, crowned by a magnificent lot of brown hair, done in an unusual and becoming style. Her brother was in the room too, a serious youth, with arched eyebrows and wearing a red necktie, who struck me as being absolutely in the dark about everything in the world, including himself. By and by a tall young man came in. He was clean-shaved with a strong bluish jaw and something of the air of a taciturn actor or of a fanatical priest, the type with thick black eyebrows, you know. But he was very presentable indeed. He shook hands at once vigorously with each of us. The young lady came up to me and murmured sweetly, Comrade Severin. I had never seen him before. He had little to say to us, but sat down by the side of the girl, and they fell at once into earnest conversation. She leaned forward in her deep armchair and took her nicely rounded chin in her beautiful white hand. He looked attentively into her eyes. It was the attitude of love-making, serious, intense, as if on the brink of the grave. I suppose she felt it necessary to round and complete her assumption of advanced ideas of revolutionary lawlessness by making believe to be in love with an anarchist. And this one, I repeat, was extremely presentable, notwithstanding his fanatical black-browed aspect. After a few stolen glances in their direction, I had no doubt that he was in earnest. As to the lady, her gestures were unapproachable, better than the very thing itself in the blended suggestion of dignity, sweetness, condescension, fascination, surrender, and reserve. She interpreted her conception of what that precise sort of lovemaking should be with consummate art. And so far, she too, no doubt, was in earnest. Gestures, but so perfect. After I had been left alone with Our Lady Amateur, I informed her guardedly of the object of my visit. I hinted at our suspicions. 
I wanted to hear what she would have to say, and half expected some perhaps unconscious revelation. All she said was, that's serious, looking delightfully concerned and grave. But there was a sparkle in her eyes which meant plainly, how exciting. After all, she knew little of anything except of words. Still, she undertook to put me in communication with Horn, who was not easy to find unless in Hermione Street, where I did not wish to show myself just then. I met Horn. This was another kind of a fanatic altogether. I exposed to him the conclusion we in Brussels had arrived at and pointed out the significant series of failures. To this, he answered with irrelevant exultation. I have something in hand that shall strike terror into the heart of these gorged brutes. And then I learned that, by excavating in one of the cellars of the house, he and some companions had made their way into the vaults under the great public building I have mentioned before. The blowing up of a whole wing was a certainty as soon as the materials were ready. I was not so appalled at the stupidity of that move as I might have been had not the usefulness of our centre in Hermione Street become already very problematical. In fact, in my opinion, it was much more of a police trap by this time than anything else. What was necessary now was to discover what, or rather who, was wrong, and I managed at last to get that idea into Horn's head. He glared, perplexed, his nostrils working as if he were sniffing treachery in the air. And here comes a piece of work, which will no doubt strike you as a sort of theatrical expedient. And yet what else could have been done? The problem was to find out the untrustworthy member of the group, but no suspicion could be fastened on one more than another. To set a watch upon them all was not very practicable. Besides, that proceeding often fails. In any case, it takes time, and the danger was pressing. I felt certain that the premises in Hermione Street would be ultimately raided, though the police had evidently such confidence in the informer that the house, for the time being, was not even watched. Horn was positive on that point. Under the circumstances, it was an unfavourable symptom. Something had to be done quickly. I decided to organise a raid myself upon the group. Do you understand? A raid of other trusty comrades personating the police. A conspiracy within a conspiracy. You see the object of it, of course. When apparently about to be arrested, I hoped the informer would betray himself in some way or other either by some unguarded act or simply by his unconcerned demeanour, for instance. Of course there was the risk of complete failure, and the no lesser risk of some fatal accident in the course of resistance, perhaps, or in the efforts at escape. For, as you will easily see, the Hermione Street group had to be actually and completely taken unawares, as I was sure they would be by the real police before very long. The informer was amongst them, and Horn alone could be let into the secret of my plan. I will not enter into the detail of my preparations. It was not very easy to arrange, but it was done very well, with a really convincing effect. The sham police invaded the restaurant, whose shutters were immediately put up. The surprise was perfect. Most of the Hermione Street Party were found in the second cellar, enlarging the hole communicating with the vaults of the great public building. At the first alarm, several comrades bolted through impulsively into the aforesaid vault, where, of course, had this been a genuine raid, they would have been hopelessly trapped. We did not bother about them for the moment. They were harmless enough. The top floor caused considerable anxiety to Horn and myself. There, surrounded by tins of stones dried soup, a comrade, nicknamed the Professor, he was an ex-science student, was engaged in perfecting some new detonators. He was an abstracted, self-confident, sallow little man, armed with large round spectacles, and we were afraid that under a mistaken impression he would blow himself up and wreck the house about our ears. I rushed upstairs and found him already at the door, on the alert, listening, as he said, to suspicious noises down below. Before I had quite finished explaining to him what was going on, he shrugged his shoulders disdainfully and turned away to his balances and test tubes. His was the true spirit of an extreme revolutionist. Explosives were his faith, his hope, his weapon, and his shield. 
He perished a couple of years afterwards in a secret laboratory through the premature explosion of one of his improved detonators. Hurrying down again, I found an impressive scene in the gloom of the big cellar. The man who personated the inspector, he was no stranger to the part, was speaking harshly and giving bogus orders to his bogus subordinates for the removal of his prisoners. Evidently, nothing enlightening had happened so far. Horn, saturnine and swarthy, waited with folded arms, and his patient, moody expectation had an air of stoicism well in keeping with the situation. I detected in the shadows one of the Hermione Street group surreptitiously chewing up and swallowing a small piece of paper. Some compromising scrap, I suppose, perhaps just a note of a few names and addresses. He was a true and faithful companion. But the fund of secret malice which lurks at the bottom of our sympathies caused me to feel amused at that perfectly uncalled-for performance. In every other respect, the risky experiment, the theatrical coup, if you like to call it so, seemed to have failed. The deception could not be kept up much longer. The explanation would bring about a very embarrassing and even grave situation. The man who had eaten the paper would be furious. The fellows who had bolted away would be angry too. To add to my vexation, the door communicating with the other cellar, where the printing presses were, flew open, and our young lady revolutionist appeared, a black silhouette in a close-fitting dress and a large hat, with the blaze of gas flaring in there at her back. Over her shoulder I perceived the arched eyebrows and the red necktie of her brother. The last people in the world I wanted to see then. They had gone that evening to some amateur concert for the delectation of the poor people, you know, but she had insisted on leaving early, on purpose to call in Hermione Street on the way home, under the pretext of having some work to do. Her usual task was to correct the proofs of the Italian and French editions of the alarm bell and the firebrand. Heavens, I murmured. I had been shown once a few copies of these publications, Nothing, in my opinion, could have been less fit for the eyes of a young lady. They were the most advanced things of the sort, advanced, I mean, beyond all bounds of reason and decency. One of them preached the dissolution of all social and domestic ties, the other advocated systematic murder. To think of a young girl calmly tracking printer's errors all along the sort of abominable sentences I remembered was intolerable to my sentiment of womanhood. Mr. X, after giving me a glance, pursued steadily. I think, however, that she came mostly to exercise her fascinations upon Severin and to receive his homage in her queenly and condescending way. She was aware of both her power and his homage, and enjoyed them with, I dare say, complete innocence. We have no ground in expediency or morals to quarrel with her on that account. Charm in woman and exceptional intelligence in man are a law unto themselves. Is it not so? I refrained from expressing my abhorrence of that licentious doctrine because of my curiosity. But what happened then? I hastened to ask. X went on crumbling slowly a small piece of bread with a careless left hand. What happened, in effect, he confessed, is that she saved the situation. She gave you an opportunity to end your rather sinister farce, I suggested. Yes, he said, preserving his impassive bearing. The farce was bound to end soon, and it ended in a very few minutes, and it ended well. Had she not come in, it might have ended badly. Her brother, of course, did not count. They had slipped into the house quietly some time before. The printing seller had an entrance of its own. Not finding anyone there, she sat down to her proofs, expecting Severin to return to his work at any moment. He did not do so. She grew impatient, heard through the door the sounds of a disturbance in the other cellar, and naturally came in to see what was the matter. Severin had been with us. At first he had seemed to me the most amazed of the whole raided lot. He appeared for an instant as if paralysed with astonishment. He stood rooted to the spot. He never moved a limb. A solitary gas jet flared near his head. All the other lights had been put out at the first alarm. And presently, from my dark corner, I observed on his shaven actor's face an expression of puzzled, vexed watchfulness. He knitted his heavy eyebrows. The corners of his mouth dropped scornfully. He was angry. 
Most likely he had seen through the game, and I regretted I had not taken him from the first into my complete confidence. But with the appearance of the girl he became obviously alarmed. It was plain. I could see it grow. The change of his expression was swift and startling, and I did not know why. The reason never occurred to me. I was merely astonished at the extreme alteration of the man's face. Of course he had not been aware of her presence in the other cellar, but that did not explain the shock her advent had given him. For a moment he seemed to have been reduced to imbecility. He opened his mouth as if to shout, or perhaps only to gasp. At any rate, it was somebody else who shouted. This somebody else was the heroic comrade whom I had detected swallowing a piece of paper. With laudable presence of mind, he let out a warning yell. It's the police! Back! Back! Run back and bolt the door behind you! It was an excellent hint, but instead of retreating, the girl continued to advance, followed by her long-faced brother in his knickerbocker suit, in which he had been singing comic songs for the entertainment of a joyless proletariat. She advanced not as if she had failed to understand, the word police has an unmistakable sound, but rather as if she could not help herself. She did not advance with the free gait and expanding presence of a distinguished amateur anarchist amongst poor, struggling professionals, but with slightly raised shoulders, and her elbows pressed close to her body, as if trying to shrink within herself. Her eyes were fixed immovably upon Severin. Severin the man, I fancy, not Severin the anarchist. But she advanced, and that was natural. For all their assumption of independence, girls of that class are used to the feeling of being specially protected, as in fact they are. This feeling accounts for nine-tenths of their audacious gestures. Her face had gone completely colourless. Ghastly. Fancy having it brought home to her so brutally that she was the sort of person who must run away from the police. I believe she was pale with indignation. Mostly, though there was, of course, also the concern for her intact personality, a vague dread of some sort of rudeness. And naturally, she turned to a man, to the man on whom she had a claim of fascination and homage, the man who could not conceivably fail her at any juncture. But, I cried, amazed at this analysis, if it had been serious, real, I mean, as she thought it was, what could she expect him to do for her? X never moved a muscle of his face. Goodness knows. I imagine that this charming, generous and independent creature had never known in her life a single genuine thought. I mean a single thought detached from small human vanities or whose source was not in some conventional perception. All I know is that after advancing a few steps she extended her hand towards the motionless Severin and that at least was no gesture. It was a natural movement. As to what she expected him to do, who can tell? The impossible. But whatever she expected, it could not have come up, I am safe to say, to what he had made up his mind to do, even before that entreating hand had appealed to him so directly. It had not been necessary. From the moment he had seen her enter that cellar, he had made up his mind to sacrifice his future usefulness, to throw off the impenetrable, solidly fastened mask it had been his pride to wear, what do you mean? I interrupted, puzzled. Was it Severin, then, who was... He was. The most persistent, the most dangerous, the craftiest, the most systematic of informers. A genius amongst betrayers. Fortunately for us, he was unique. The man was a fanatic, I've told you. Fortunately, again, for us, he had fallen in love with the accomplished and innocent gestures of that girl. An actor in desperate earnest himself, he must have believed in the absolute value of conventional signs. As to the grossness of the trap into which he fell, the explanation must be that two sentiments of such absorbing magnitude cannot exist simultaneously in one heart. The danger of that other and unconscious comedian robbed him of his vision, of his perspicacity, of his judgment. Indeed, it did at first rob him of his self-possession but he regained that through the necessity, as it appeared to him imperiously, to do something at once. To do what? Why, to get her out of the house as quickly as possible? He was desperately anxious to do that. I have told you he was terrified. 
It could not be about himself. He had been surprised and annoyed at a move quite unforeseen and premature. I may even say he had been furious. He was accustomed to arrange the last scene of his betrayals with a deep, subtle art which left his revolutionist reputation untouched. But it seems clear to me that at the same time he had resolved to make the best of it, to keep his mask resolutely on. It was only with the discovery of her being in the house that everything, the forced calm, the restraint of his fanaticism, the mask, all came off together in a kind of panic. Why panic, do you ask? The answer is very simple. He remembered, or I dare say he had never forgotten, the professor alone at the top of the house, pursuing his researches, surrounded by tins upon tins of stone's dried soup. There was enough in some few of them to bury us all where we stood under a heap of bricks. Severin, of course, was aware of that, and we must believe also that he knew the exact character of the man. He had gauged so many such characters, or perhaps he only gave the professor credit for what he himself was capable of. But in any case, the effect was produced, and suddenly he raised his voice in authority. Get the lady away at once. It turned out that he was as hoarse as a crow, result, no doubt, of the intense emotion. It passed off in a moment, but these fateful words issued forth from his contracted throat in a discordant, ridiculous croak. They required no answer. The thing was done. However, the man personating the inspector judged it expedient to say roughly, She shall go soon enough, together with the rest of you. These were the last words belonging to the comedy part of this affair. Oblivious of everything and everybody, Severin strode towards him and seized the lapels of his coat. Under his thin, bluish cheeks, one could see his jaws working with passion. You have men posted outside. Get the lady taken home at once. Do you hear? Now, before you try to get hold of the man upstairs. Oh, there is a man upstairs, scoffed the other openly. Well, he shall be brought down in time to see the end of this. But Severin, beside himself, took no heed of the tone. Who's the imbecile meddler who sent you blundering here? Didn't you understand your instructions? Don't you know anything? It's incredible. Here. He dropped the lapels of the coat and, plunging his hand into his breast, jerked feverishly at something under his shirt. At last, he produced a small square pocket of soft leather, which must have been hanging like a scapulary from his neck by the tape whose broken ends dangled from his fist. Look inside, he spluttered, flinging it in the other's face. And instantly, he turned round towards the girl. She stood just behind him, perfectly still and silent. Her set, white face gave an illusion of placidity. Only her staring eyes seemed bigger and darker. He spoke rapidly with nervous assurance. I heard him distinctly promise her to make everything as clear as daylight presently, but that was all I caught. He stood close to her, never attempting to touch her, even with the tip of his little finger, and she stared at him stupidly. For a moment, however, her eyelids descended slowly, pathetically, and then, with the long black eyelashes lying on her white cheeks, she looked ready to fall down in a swoon, but she never even swayed where she stood. He urged her loudly to follow him at once and walked towards the door at the bottom of the cellar stairs without looking behind him, and, as a matter of fact, she did move after him a pace or two. But of course, he was not allowed to reach the door. There were angry exclamations, a short, fierce scuffle. Flung away violently, he came flying backwards upon her and fell. She threw out her arms in a gesture of dismay and stepped aside, just clear of his head, which struck the ground heavily near her shoe. He grunted with the shock. By the time he had picked himself up, slowly, dazedly, he was awake to the reality of things. The man into whose hands he had thrust the leather case had extracted there from a narrow strip of bluish paper. He held it up above his head, and, as after the scuffle, an expectant, uneasy stillness reigned once more, he threw it down disdainfully with the words, I think, comrades, that this proof was hardly necessary. Quick as thought, 
the girl stooped after the fluttering slip. Holding it spread out in both hands, she looked at it, then, without raising her eyes, opened her fingers slowly and let it fall. I examined that curious document afterwards. It was signed by a very high personage and stamped and countersigned by other high officials in various countries of Europe. In his trade, or shall I say, in his mission, that sort of talisman might have been necessary, no doubt. Even to the police itself, all but the heads, he had been known only as Severin, the noted anarchist. He hung his head, biting his lower lip. A change had come over him, a sort of thoughtful, absorbed calmness. Nevertheless, he panted. His sides worked visibly, and his nostrils expanded and collapsed in weird contrast with his sombre aspect of a fanatical monk in a meditative attitude, but with something, too, in his face of an actor intent upon the terrible exigencies of his part. Before him, Horn declaimed, haggard and bearded, like an inspired denunciatory prophet from a wilderness. Two fanatics. They were made to understand each other. Does this surprise you? I suppose you think that such people would be foaming at the mouth and snarling at each other. I protested hastily that I was not surprised in the least, that I thought nothing of the kind, that anarchists in general were simply inconceivable to me mentally, morally, logically, sentimentally, and even physically. X received this declaration with his usual woodenness and went on. Horn had burst out into eloquence. While pouring out scornful invective, he let tears escape from his eyes and rolled down his black beard unheeded. Severin panted quicker and quicker. When he opened his mouth to speak, everyone hung on his words. Don't be a fool, Horn, he began. You know very well that I have done this for none of the reasons you are throwing at me. And in a moment, he became outwardly as steady as a rock under the other's lurid stare. I have been thwarting, deceiving, and betraying you from conviction. He turned his back on Horn, and addressing the girl, repeated the words, from conviction. It's extraordinary how cold she looked. I suppose she could not think of any appropriate gesture. There can have been few precedents indeed for such a situation. Clear as daylight, he added. Do you understand what that means? From conviction. And still she did not stir. She did not know what to do. But the luckless wretch was about to give her the opportunity for a beautiful and correct gesture. I have felt in me the power to make you share this conviction, he protested, ardently. He had forgotten himself. He made a step towards her. Perhaps he stumbled. To me, he seemed to be stooping low as if to touch the hem of her garment. And then the appropriate gesture came. She snatched her skirt away from his polluting contact and averted her head with an upward tilt. It was magnificently done, this gesture of conventionally unstained honour of an unblemished high-minded amateur. Nothing could have been better, and he seemed to think so too, for once more he turned away. But this time he faced no one. He was again panting frightfully, while he fumbled hurriedly in his waistcoat pocket and then raised his hand to his lips. There was something furtive in this movement, but directly afterwards his bearing changed. His laboured breathing gave him a resemblance to a man who had just run a desperate race, but a curious air of detachment, of sudden and profound indifference, replaced the strain of the striving effort. The race was over. I did not want to see what would happen next. I was only too well aware. I tucked the young lady's arm under mine without a word and made my way with her to the stairs. Her brother walked behind us. Halfway up the short flight, she seemed unable to lift her feet high enough for the steps, and we had to pull and push to get her to the top. In the passage, she dragged herself along, hanging on my arm, helplessly bent like an old woman. We issued into an empty street through a half-open door, staggering like besotted revellers. At the corner, we stopped a four-wheeler, and the ancient driver looked round from his box with morose scorn at our efforts to get her in. Twice during the drive, I felt her collapse on my shoulder in a half-faint. Facing us, the youth in knickerbockers remained as mute as a fish, until he jumped out with the latchkey, sat more still than I would have believed it possible. 
At the door of their drawing room, she left my arm and walked in first, catching at the chairs and tables. She unpinned her hat, then, exhausted with the effort, her cloak still hanging from her shoulders, flung herself into a deep armchair, sideways, her face half buried in a cushion. The good brother appeared silently before her with a glass of water. She motioned it away. He drank it himself and walked off to a distant corner, behind the grand piano, somewhere. All was still in this room where I had seen, for the first time, Severin, the anti-anarchist, captivated and spellbound by the consummate and hereditary grimaces that in a certain sphere of life take the place of feelings with an excellent effect. I suppose her thoughts were busy with the same memory. Her shoulders shook violently. A pure attack of nerves. When it quieted down, she affected firmness. What is done to a man of that sort? What will they do to him? Nothing. They can do nothing to him, I assured her with perfect truth. I was pretty certain he had died in less than twenty minutes from the moment his hand had gone to his lips, for if his fanatical anti-anarchism went even as far as carrying poison in his pocket only to rob his adversaries of legitimate vengeance, I knew he would take care to provide something that would not fail him when required. She drew an angry breath. There were red spots on her cheeks and a feverish brilliance in her eyes. Has ever anyone been exposed to such a terrible experience? To think that he had held my hand? That man! Her face twitched. She gulped down a pathetic sob. If I ever felt sure of anything, it was of Severin's high-minded motives. Then she began to weep quietly, which was good for her. Then, through her flood of tears, half resentful, what was it he said to me? From conviction. It seemed a vile mockery. What could he mean by it? That, my dear young lady, I said gently, is more than I or anybody else can ever explain to you. Mr. X flicked a crumb off the front of his coat, and that was strictly true as to her, though Horn, for instance, understood very well, and so did I, especially after we had been to Severin's lodging in a dismal back street of an intensely respectable quarter. Horn was known there as a friend, and we had no difficulty in being admitted, the slatternly maid merely remarking, as she let us in, that Mr. Severin had not been home that night. We forced open a couple of drawers in the way of duty, and found a little useful information. The most interesting part was his diary, for this man, engaged in such deadly work, had the weakness to keep a record of the most damnatory kind. There were his acts, and also his thoughts laid bare to us. But the dead don't mind that. They don't mind anything. From conviction. Yes. A vague but ardent humanitarianism had urged him in his first youth into the bitterest extremity of negation and revolt. Afterwards, his optimism flinched. He doubted and became lost. You have heard of converted atheists. These turn often into dangerous fanatics but the soul remains the same. After he had got acquainted with the girl, there are to be met in that diary of his very queer politico-amorous rhapsodies. He took her sovereign grimaces with deadly seriousness. He longed to convert her, but all this cannot interest you. For the rest, I don't know if you remember, it is a good many years ago now, the journalistic sensation of the Hermione Street mystery the finding of a man's body in the cellar of an empty house, the inquest, some arrests, many surmises, then silence, the usual end for many obscure martyrs and confessors. The fact is, he was not enough of an optimist. You must be a savage, tyrannical, pitiless, thick and thin optimist, like Horn, for instance, to make a good social rebel of the extreme type. He rose from the table, a waiter hurried up with his overcoat. Another held his hat in readiness. But what became of the young lady? I asked. Do you really want to know? He said, buttoning himself in his fur coat carefully. I confess to the small malice of sending her Severin's diary. She went into retirement. Then she went to Florence. Then she went into retreat in a convent. I can't tell where she will go next. What does it matter? Gestures. Gestures mere gestures of her class. 
He fitted on his glossy high hat with extreme precision, and casting a rapid glance round the room, full of well-dressed people innocently dining, muttered between his teeth, and nothing else. That is why their kind is fated to perish. I never met Mr. X again after that evening. I took to dining at my club. On my next visit to Paris, I found my friend all impatience to hear of the effect produced on me by this rare item of his collection. I told him all the story, and he beamed on me with the pride of his distinguished specimen. Isn't X well worth knowing? He bubbled over in great delight. He's unique, amazing, absolutely terrific. His enthusiasm grated upon my finer feelings. I told him curtly that the man's cynicism was simply abominable. Oh, abominable, abominable, assented my friend effusively. And then, you know, he likes to have his little joke sometimes, he added in a confidential tone. I fail to understand the connection of this last remark. I have been utterly unable to discover where in all this the joke comes in.